So, continuing on um, in, in discussing chorioamnionitis. So we discussed how there's ascending infection from the lower genital tract that colonizes the amniotic fluid and elicits a maternal inflammatory response both along the maternal spiral arteries within the decidua capsularis as well as within the subchorionic maternal blood space, and in both cases you see neutrophils. So, in looking at histological sections of the fetal membranes, one of the questions that staff like to ask residents is, they point to these neutrophils and they say, whose neutrophils are they? And the answer is maternal. And so too, if the staff were to point to these neutrophils and say, whose neutrophils are they? The answer is maternal. In the context of all of this bacterial infection and the cytokines released by the maternal cells, the um, inflammatory mediators released by the maternal neutrophils, at some point as things progress, the fetus can now engender a response. The fetus will get an inflammatory response. So if we were to look at a section right here through the umbilical cord, Let's put the section down here. Here are the fetal arteries, and this is the fetal vein. And what we start to see are fetal neutrophils, and I'll draw those in green. Fetal neutrophils start to line up along first the vein, and then the artery. And then they actually get into the muscularis of the vessels. And at that point, we call it, when the fetal neutrophils have actually gone beyond the intima and into the muscularis, this is what we call a fetal vascular response. This is a fetal vascular response. Fetal vascular response to the chorioamnionitis. And in this case, it's an umbilical vessel vasculitis. So you'll often see that on, 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 on pathology reports, you'll see chorioamnionitis with fetal vascular response dash umbilical vessel vasculitis. And then the next thing that could happen is the neutrophils will actually go beyond the confines of the vessel and into Wharton's jelly. And when there's fetal neutrophils in Wharton's jelly as part of the fetal vascular response to a chorioamnionitis, that's what we call a funicitis. So that's what a funicitis is. It's a fetal vascular response to a chorioamnionitis. So you could see chorioamnionitis with fetal vascular response, including umbilical vessel vasculitis and funicitis. And the other portion of the fetal circulation where you could see a response is along the chorionic vessels. So the chorionic vessels here, 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 branches of the umbilical vessels can also show a fetal inflammatory response to the infection and the maternal inflammation. And so if we imagine a cross-section here, right here through the chorionic plate, here the umbilical vessel and umbilical vessels, umbilical cord coming in, and histologically here are some fetal vessels, and like I said before, in the chorionic plate you often catch sort of oblong shapes of fetal vessels Sorry, I'll put that in white. You often catch oblong shapes, shapes of fetal vessels, and you don't always know if they're arteries or veins. And they run through the chorionic plate in sort of a, you, could, you usually catch them in oblique orientation. And so, too, these vessels start to show a fetal inflammatory response, first along the intima, and then the vessels go beyond, and they sort of concentrically follow within the muscularis of the vessel within the media of the vessel, they sort of follow along the contour concentrically, and this is a chorionic vessel vasculitis, a chorionic vessel vasculitis, and it's also a fetal vascular response to the chorioamnionitis. So if you have a relatively progressive chorioamnionitis, and I often report this, I'll say chorioamnionitis, and that implies ascending infection with maternal inflammatory response. So my diagnostic line reads chorioamnionitis, and then I say with fetal vascular response, including umbilical vessel vasculitis, comma, funicitis, and chorionic vessel vasculitis. So that means that both mother and baby are responding to both the bacteria and the overall inflammatory milieu that's been created. So now, I just want to discuss some of the specific organisms. So, most of the organisms in an ascending infection will either be mixed, mixed flora, so could the ascending infection could be mixed flora, usually mixed 
vaginal flora, and they're not usually always even pathogens, but just in the context of having access to a space that they normally don't have access to, specifically the amniotic fluid, the organisms then go from being colonizers in the context of pregnancy to being pathogens. But some women are colonized with group B strep, and group B strep, when it gets access to the amniotic space, and obviously to the fetus too, because the fetus is swallowing and practice breathing amniotic fluid, the group B strep within the fluid fetus could be quite devastating. This could be quite serious. And so that's why it's standard practice to, for the optician to take swabs and try to see if the mother is group B strep positive at usually around 36 weeks or so, even before the onset of labor, because it's good to know in case rupture of membranes occurs for a prolonged period prior to the onset of labor. I just want to discuss a few sort of rare instances, but specific organisms that it's important for the pathologist to know about. And one of them is, yes, it's normally bacteria that they send, but occasionally you could have candida within the vaginal canal, and the candida could ascend as well. So, so you could have candida pseudohyphae and, and yeast organisms, and they can get access to the amniotic fluid. It's rare, but it could happen. And what tends to happen in that case is the pseudohyphae often invade into the amnion of the umbilical cord. So if you look at the umbilical cord, the pseudohyphae, the fungal pseudohyphae, often sort of set up almost like a little ca colony on the amnion of the umbilical cord, right here, on the external surface, because don't forget they're coming from the outside. And what that'll then elicit is a fetal inflammatory response by way of neutrophils forming like a microaggregate or a microabscess on the outside, sort of orienting toward the amnion. So unlike the fetal vascular response that we get in chorioamnionitis, which is usually based around the vessels, like I'm showing here, in a candidal funicitis, what you usually see in candidal infection is these microabscesses arranged on the outer surface of the umbilical cord. And even grossly, what's often seen are white deposits. You could actually see white precipitates or white deposits along the umbilical cord and sometimes along the fetal surface of the placenta, usually at the base of the cord insertion. So if you're ever doing a gross of a placenta and you see white deposits all along the umbilical cord, definitely take sections of those and do them rather urgently because if the then pathologist on cross-section, if you then see um, fetal microapses, then you do a fungal stain. And if the fungal stain, like a Grocot or a PAS, then re reveals fungal organisms within this abscess on sort of oriented toward the amniotic side of the umbilical cord, that could be a candidal or fungal funicitis, which is quite serious. And that's a, an, really an emergency, and one should notify the clinicians urgently. That would be called, uh, uh, in my opinion, that's a critical report, so, or an urgent report. Your lab should probably flag that as an urgent report. But just know that most cases of chorioamnionitis are, are bacterial. It's, it, d don't worry about the fungal one or don't make a diagnosis unless you have definite evidence of fungal, uh, morphological fungal organisms usually forming this fungal funicitis. The next thing that I want to mention somewhat briefly is that while most organisms that we've discussed are ascending organisms that come in via the amniotic fluid, it is possible to get infection of the placenta and even fetus via maternal hematogenous route. So directly from the placenta, so instead of an ascending infection, it comes from the vessels within the decidua capsularis and straight through the substance of the placenta. So in this schema, you could imagine, instead of the organisms coming along here, in this instance, the organisms are going to come along here from the maternal blood. The maternal organisms are going to come through the maternal blood space and imagine here are the organisms and then gain access to the maternal blood space and then the organisms get access this way. And not too many bacteria do that. Most bacteria will come in through the ascending route, through the amniotic, through a, ru a rupture in the amniotic membranes.
but some bacteria, now we're talking about bacteria, are maternally transmitted, rarely, are maternally transmitted through the spiral arteries, for example, of the decidua capsularis. And an example of a bacteria that does that would be Listeria monocytogenes, where Listeria comes in through the maternal blood space. As a consequence, the pattern of inflammation that we see in Listeria is different than the pattern of inflammation of an ascending chorioamnionitis. So whereas in an ascending chorioamnionitis, what you see is in maternal inflammation of the fetal membranes and maternal inflammation of the subchorionic space, in Listeria, the bacteria come in hematogenously from the maternal circulation, and imagine the bacteria are colonizing here. So what you'll often get is a microapsis in the intervillous space. So if you see a pattern of intervillous microapsises, such as microapsis here in the maternal space between the villi. So if you see intervillous microapsis, then the root of inflammation may be or is more likely to be hematogenous. And one organism in your differential diagnosis would be listeria. So histologically, here's your intervillous space. What you'll see is maternal neutrophils forming a literal microapsis in the intervillous space between the villi. And if you look at a section of placenta, even grossly, so let's just imagine this is just a gross slice of the placenta. I do it very small. You actually will grossly see white dots. And this, once again, suggests intervillous microapsis as a microscopic correlate might be this. So this might be the gross appearance. The microscopic appearance will be these microapsis in the intervillous space which in my schema is here, 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 the space between the villi. And, you know, in a real slide, it sort of looks right here and here. And that would suggest the hematogenous route of, 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 of dissemination. And you'd really have to worry about listeria. And that could be even a public health risk because the mother may have acquired hem that the mother has hematogenous listeria because it's in the mother's bloodstream in order to get in through the spiral arterioles here. And, 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 and often there could be a food source or some other source. So that's something you know, that public health officials need to be aware of. So you would do the gram stain and try to confirm it. You might do a gram stain and you might find the organisms. And if you could confirm listeria, then, then that's a reportable infection. Just a brief word on torch infections. So torch infections are um, you, the kind of infections that could actually result in fetal dysmorphology. And so too, torch infections usually affect the baby by a hematogenous route. But some of the torch infections, particularly HSV, and sometimes I believe CMV, but usually, usually HSV, can actually come by an ascending route. So now we're talking about viruses, not bacteria. So usually torch infections and viruses will come by a hematogenous route so that they're not ascending, they usually affect the fetus from the maternal blood. But I'm just mentioning this for clarification. HSV is a virus that can come to the fetus as an ascending infection. And therefore, the baby's in this context, won't get sick in utero, what happens is they get the organism in passage through the birth canal, and then th the HSV, they could get systemic disease later on. So, um, you know, in the first week of life, and let's say three or four days, the babies could have a devastating illness. And, you know, some, for this reason, sometimes women are given prophylac prophylactic antivirals if they're known to have HSV. And also, in addition, if there's active lesions, there is an option to do a cesarean section. But I only bring that up to, to, to let you know that even viruses can occur both by the hematogenous as well as the ascending route. But whereas bacteria are most often the ascending route and only rarely the hematogenous route, for viruses, it's in a sense, more the contrary, where often viruses, if they do affect the fetus, could come by the hematogenous route, with one very notable exception, and that's HSV, that can present as an ascending infection or a a infection acquired in transit through the birth canal, and, and, and it's important to know about HSV because it could be quite devastating.
So I hope this helps. This was sort of an attempt to help orient you to where the inflammation and infections are coming from in chorioamnionitis.